So as this is happening and they're considering this and the apostles are watching this happen, they see something else. And what is the else that they see? There in the brightness? Yeah. Something like in the fiery furnace. How many guys did we put in there? Three. And what do you see now? I see four. Have any of you seen the VeggieTales version of that story? And the one guy is really shiny. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's the manifestation of the glory of the Lord. That's, that's what's going on there. Um, I forgot what that episode is. Oh, Rack Shack and Benny, right? For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, the glory of the Lord in the lion's den, or in the fiery furnace as well. So who shows up with Jesus? Who are the, three, the two guys? Just then Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with Jesus. No, I misspoke. The appearance of Moses and Elijah has been a, a help to me in preaching my whole ministry because it didn't have to be these two exactly. We sometimes talk about why these two. First of all, why would Moses be one to speak to Christ before his passion begins? Well, Moses was the lawgiver. If you talk about the prophets, some people will even forget to add Moses because he's in a class so far above the others all by himself. You know, I mean, if you're going to talk about prophets, a lot of people would start with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth, but they would forget the great Moses. Because wasn't he a lot more than a prophet? Sure, but he was a prophet um, and gave the law. By the way, of these two guys, can you see them up there flying? Which one is Moses? Look at what he's holding. Can't see that far? The one on the right has little, a little piece of stone. Uh, the one on the right, I believe, is Moses. The one on the left is, seems to be Elijah, who is not really holding anything. He's just kind of hovering there with his arms crossed. Um, uh, but uh, Moses and Elijah. Why Elijah? Those are good answers. He, Elijah spoke with God, saw him at Mount Sinai, by the way. Uh, he was taken into heaven physically. Um, also, of the, of, the, of, the, of the prophets after Moses, he stands as the greatest of those, the first of the, late, of the not the latter prophets, but the later prophets. Elijah stands with them. Another thing? Well, this is for Jesus' comfort since he's about to die. Yeah. I thought about Elijah. I always, when I see Elijah's name, I think of Jesus' comfort. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And he got attacked. And they, I mean, they all did, but, but Elijah got attacked in special ways. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Was ready to there, there, are, there are a lot of other things about those two guys we could, we could list. The, the one thing I wanted to talk about that's also helpful is that Moses died, Elijah didn't. And so what we also have here is a picture of our reunion in heaven. Is there any difference to the disciples within the glory of the Lord, sort of this uh, pocket of heaven, if you will, if I can put it that way, is there any difference between the spirit of Moses, who's dead and buried, and the body of Elijah, who did not separate body from soul? There's no difference, right? Moses has the characteristics of Elijah. 
of, or rather of, of Moses' body. So Moses has voice, personality, the things I talked about in the sermon on Sunday that his soul has, that it shares with the body, memory, I, you can, sense of humor, um, but, and, and also uh, uh, desires and things like that. The body here on earth shares its fallen desires with the soul here on earth. So the soul sins. And as God tells Ezekiel, the soul that sins is the soul that shall die. So there are a lot of proof passages that, I, that, that are there for those things. I didn't give you in the pulpit on Sunday, but the soul is a remarkable study. Um, and the Greeks had the soul completely wrong. The Greeks thought that the soul had to be removed from the body and the body discarded completely so the soul could go to heaven and never be rejoined with the body because the body was evil. But that's not the way God tells us about it. Um, that the soul leaves the body at death because the soul can't die. But in the resurrection, the body comes back to life, the soul rejoins the body because a human body can't live without the soul. It has the breath of life in it and so on. Okay. So there's usefulness to, to the humble teacher here of those two particular guys. Um, they're... Uh, uh, with Christ, but also some theological value in just the, the if, if I just put it this way, here you have personified Moses and the prophets. That is all of the Old Testament preaching about the coming Savior is encapsulated by those two men, Moses and the prophet. Um, so that's what Peter, James, and John see. And then Peter speaks up before anybody can stop him. <laughs> By the way, can I just, can I just also say that, uh, you see what Moses' feet are resting on on the right there? The clouds are kind of acting like stones or platforms or something. The, the artist very subtly gives your mind something to hang on to. You know? Some people would be uncomfortable maybe with, with a hovering, you know, a, a person. But this artist said, ah, let's pretend the clouds could hold his weight, you know. Have any of you ever been inside of a cloud? You also all have every time fog shows up. Um, but I have also on a mountain. Um, on Mount Rainier, I've been inside of a cloud that from below is obviously a cloud, but I've been up inside of it. And what is it when you're inside of it? It's just kind of damp, you know, not much of anything else. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Why did Peter want to make three shelters for Jesus? Partly. It may also have had to do with this. That is a sukkah. It's what they stayed in today. Today is the beginning of Sukkot. Did you know that? It's the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's a tabernacle. Yeah. It's the, it's the camping out festival that happens every year among Israelites in late September, early October. It's, this year it's early October. But that's where they go out and have a big party in this camping out festival. They have this little shelter they make. That one looks like it was made by the professor and skipper because um, it's all bamboo. Uh, and, uh, but um, you've got ordinary tables there and chairs and they're going to have a big party there. Looks to me like it's lemonade in the back in those big glass lemonade-y things. I think that'd be pretty fun. Um, and they would just, and, and, and they would ceremonially camp out for a week. That's what Sukkot is. To remember the days in the sojourn coming out of Egypt we stayed in tents 
And so now we're going to stay in tents for a week. And it ends with the great day of atonement. So that's, that's what it was designed to do. Yes? Was it tents in Jesus' time that were pitched in Jerusalem? Or is this, I'm asking, is this a modern thing? This one is a modern one, but they looked, they were probably, and in, in Jesus' day, it was very likely um, something much more ramshackle than this. Uh, you'd put up a couple of sticks and then cover them with palm fronds, and it wouldn't be much more than that. Um, I was I was I was getting all of this uh, these pictures two weeks ago on a Friday night, and I forgot that the uh, I was I was think I was in here or upstairs, might have been the sacristy on a Friday night working on this, and I forgot that um, the Wi-Fi shuts down on the weekends here at St. Paul. All of a sudden, I had no internet, so instead of twenty pictures, I ended up with one. But I got one. I thought that's good enough, and I knew I was going to be busy between now and then, so you just get one, but sorry about that. But that's the, that's the festival, I, and it's very reasonable to think that this was, yeah, it fits chronologically that this was October before the crucifixion. And then, oh, it's tabernacles. You know what, Jesus? I'll build the tabernacles. I'll build them. You're here, let's, and we'll, we'll hang out. We'll have, can you imagine Peter says, I'll make the hut. James and John, you slaughter the lamb and we'll cook the food for Moses and Elijah. Yeah. I don't know how much food Moses would have required, but Elijah would probably still be hungry. Um, but uh, but uh, really cool stuff. But I also want to point out this. Deuteronomy 13. I have it in my notes, just the reference, but this is the whole passage. If your very own brother, your son or daughter, or the wife you love, or your closest friend, secretly entices you, saying, let us go and worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your fathers have known, gods of the peoples around you, whether near or far, from one end of the land to the other, do not yield to him or listen to him. Show him no pity. Do not spare him or shield him. You must certainly put him to death. Your hand must be the first in putting him to death. And then the hands of all the people stone him to death because he tried to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now that horrifying passage, I have, um, forgot where we have it on the sheet here. Oh, and comparing what Jesus says in the next verse, um, which is show the sinner. No, if anybody tries to steer you toward a different God, they're dead. That's a dead man. Now what does the father say? While he was speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. Just then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Through the whole Old Testament, don't listen to any other God except me. If anybody even entices you to listen to another God, you kill him with your own hand. You kill him. And now what does the Father say? Yes. Listen to Jesus. How, how stunned they were. And the disciples' reaction is exactly this reaction. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down and were terrified. Because what does that mean about Jesus? He's God. The, the son of God equals God. Um, so this is my son, the father says. Um, and that shows the relationship of father to son. The divinity of Christ. Whom I love shows the obedience of Christ. Um, Jesus didn't do anything to, uh, to nullify that, to, 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 to squish that. And the Father even says, with him I am well pleased. Not only has he not disobeyed me, but he has pleased me with everything that he has done and said and thought. Who, does, who else does God say I am well pleased with him in all of Scripture? 
Nobody. I am well pleased. Um, and then he says, listen to him. Even with Moses, he said, listen to me. Now he says, listen to him. Whatever you've gotten from me for these past millennia, the father says, now listen to him. He speaks for me. He's my mouthpiece. What did John call him? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. There is nothing about Jesus that is not divine. Um, and then John, if that's the conclusion of the prologue, he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling with us. And that's really the identity of the word Emmanuel. God made his dwelling among us. It isn't that we want to build tabernacles for Jesus and Moses and Elijah. It's that we should be amazed that he has come and tabernacled with us. He's made his dwelling among us. Go ahead, Mrs. T. You just had some, I just had something slide into place. Yeah. So that they have it. Oh, it's John 1 18. It's the same. It's the same passage, same thing. But um, to allow them to chew on it for the rest of their lives, you have to give it to them before they can meditate on it, before they can let it rest. A man came up to me Sunday all smiles with his grandfather who's our member and he said I want to take communion with you and he said now I know it's not your practice and he should have stopped right there and turned around and walked back to his pew but he didn't. Um, and he said, I know it's not your practice, but I'm this other synod and a Lutheran synod. And he said, and, I, and it's their practice too that outsiders don't come and take communion with them. And I thought, okay, you know our practice, it's your practice. <laughs> and, and he said, but I believe in Jesus. And I said, that's not the requirement that fellowship holds up. Um, the, and I, I didn't have a lot of time to talk to him because I, had, I was getting ready for a baptism and for another church service coming up. Um, but he was clearly getting more and more emotional. And I, I didn't have the time at the moment to explain this to him. But his sad emotions were part of the point of the doctrine of fellowship. The doctrine of church fellowship is not there to make you feel good about yourself you know, when, when you are excluded from it. It's there to make you feel bad. It's quite a bit like the doctrine of law in the comparison of law and gospel. Um, and I know that often we say, we are not judging your faith. And, he, and, and this man also said, it feels like you're judging me. And I said, we are judging you. We're judging your fellowship, not your faith, but your fellowship. You belong to a denomination that has taught false doctrine and that is not in fellowship with us and what the Bible says. And he said, but it, it doesn't feel right. And I said, it's not supposed to feel right. Um, and he went away. I could even say he went away sad. Um, but this was overheard by a couple of people who then came to me and said, I like the way you put that. You know, and I wasn't looking for reinforcement from them. I'm doing my job. It's my divine call from you to uphold the doctrines of this church body and of scripture. And that's what I was doing. It's not always fun. 
Um, quite often, it's, it, uh, it can be uh, frightening, depending on the individual that you're talking to. And sometimes it can be heart-wrenching, and it can be frustrating. And it's hardest to do right before a funeral, because people always want to change our doctrine right before a funeral. Can't you make an exception? Well, if I make an exception for you, I've changed the doctrine. It's, that, that's, it's no longer an exception. Um, and it, because it becomes practice then. And quite often it happens uh, when people are planning a wedding as well. Um, but nevertheless, it stands there. The thing about the doctrine of church fellowship, just to wrap that up, is that it's one of the only doctrines that's clearly taught in all 27 books of the New Testament. How many doctrines are in every New Testament book? If you think of the length of Philemon, of, uh, of 2 John, of 3 John, of Jude, but, uh, but fellowship is there in all of those. In fact, in 2 and 3 John, fellowship is practically the only doctrine Apart from salvation, apart from Christ, apart from justification, fellowship is what 2nd and 3rd John are all about. Um, probably we should make a detour coming up sometime and I can talk more about that particular doctrine. But I have, I have one more thing to tell you about that because um, six, seven years ago, correct me on the date, I had planned for a year to preach a sermon on 2 John to explain the doctrine of church fellowship in a sermon to the congregation. It was going to be a big deal and, and so forth. And what happened? Pastor Sharf took a call and joined us. And that Sunday got assigned to him as his very first sermon. I had been planning this for a year. And, then, and, and, the, and I felt bad because I, what I said was, I, let's just move the text. You can preach on anything you want to. Preach on the gospel of the day. And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll take fellowship. So I never got to. And he did. And he himself expressed uh, doubts about it even that morning before he preached. And he, and he said, I shouldn't have done this. You should have had me preach on something else. I, I tried to get you to preach on something else, but that was his, I don't know if you remember his first sermon here, but that was it. And, uh, I, and I had waited and waited and kind of bided my time and studied and I was going to do it. Um, and then I did the same thing happened with a, with a Sunday morning Bible class. I was waiting, I, was, I, was, I had this scheduled and bided my time, was going to teach this in a, in a Sunday morning series. And then I got help scheduling Sunday morning. And the, all of those Sundays got assigned to somebody else. And it kind of just went away. And uh, so I... I Something was keeping me from teaching this. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll get back to it some other way. Terrified apostles, let's keep going. Jesus approached and as he touched them, he said, get up, do not be afraid. When they opened their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, do not tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Um, so another secret to keep, but one of the last ones, as they're coming down the mountain now, let's just review what especially do we learn from the transfiguration. Um, a few things. Number one, Christ was glorified by God the Father as a testimony to Jesus' status as the Son of God. This was a sermon in an action. Number two, Christ was shown to be the only possible candidate for the coming sacrifice for the sin of mankind. John had said it, look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now the Father agrees. The Father declared his love for the Son. Um, I don't know if, if we always understand how important that is, but that profound love, and yet what did the father do to him? He punished him the way he wants to punish, the way he must punish all sinners in hell, and all of that got dumped on Jesus. But the father says, first of all, remember how much I love him. 
And then the father declared the superiority of the son uh, in all teaching by saying, listen to him. That's the father saying, he is your teacher. We technically have a couple minutes left. Would you like me to go on or would you like to ask anything about either the transfiguration or I open this up to my catechism students once a, once a semester. You can ask me anything you want to. Keep going? Keep going. Does Beth speak for all? Question. They weren't required any longer. Yeah, they, they appeared. They were there to talk to Jesus, very likely to comfort him, to strengthen him, but then back, back to heaven. Jesus didn't have to have them tagging along through the whole passion. You know, they don't build the tabernacles. They don't come along with. What would the Jews have done to Moses? In Jerusalem. What would they have done to Elijah? If, 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 and I, and I kind of think if both of those prophets had shown up and, 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 and looked Caiaphas in the eye and seen the other high priest stooping for rocks, Moses would have turned to Jesus and said, no, not again. You know, how often have we gone through this for you? Um, so, no, their work was done. They, knew, they do know eternal rest and peace. They don't have to go through that again. His disciples asked him, then why do the experts in the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered, yes, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him. Instead, they did to him whatever they desired. In the same way, the Son of Man will also suffer at their hands. And the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Now they understand. He doesn't have to lay it out for them any longer. Oh, you told us that John was Elijah, and now we understand. We've seen Elijah. We understand. They did it. Elijah came and they killed him. Elijah was John. Now one little incident here at the tail end. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt in front of him. Lord, he said, have mercy on my son. By the way, he starts with Lord. Does the devil attack believers? Absolutely he does. Have mercy on my son because he has seizures and is suffering terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they were not able to cure him. So the devil may use ordinary means to attack us here. Water, fire. The devil wants to kill us. That's his goal with us. Um, I want to kill your body on earth. I'd really rather kill your soul forever in heaven by having you uh, uh, separate from God forever. And the devil is a powerful enemy. The other nine, my math right, were not able to cure him. So some things about this particular uh, uh, demon possession uh, or attacks by the devil. Jesus answered, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. And perverse generation, the more I read this and study it, the more I'm in agreement with our theologians who say that Jesus is not talking about the, the nation here, but about the nine down at the foot of the mountain. This is how long must I be with you or put up with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and went out of the boy and he was cured from that hour. So this was not complete unbelief, but something more like doubt. They were failing ultimately to believe Jesus' command to drive out demons. And they weren't able to do it. And Jesus says, how, do I, how can I put up with you? And then they come and ask why. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, 
why were we unable to drive it out? And he said to them, because of your little faith. So he, this is where he amends this to say, this generation is you guys. Amen, I tell you, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. Nothing will be impossible for you. In the gospel lesson on Sunday, it wasn't a mountain, what was it? Do you, you recall? It's a mulberry tree. Can, it was mulberry tree. And, but then Jesus says, but this, time, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. That verse, there's a question on, does it belong here? And I apologize for kind of ending the class on this note, but the textual evidence suggests that this verse was brought in from a different gospel, from Mark 9. It's the same account, therefore it still applies, but the earliest witnesses of Matthew don't have it. Um, and the phrase, except by prayer, does show that they were not trusting in God, but doubting their own abilities, perhaps thinking of this as their power rather than as something God gave them to do. Um, and the, the fasting part of it shows devotion to God and trusting in him alone. Pray, trust, and fast, show your devotion. Um, so, but Jesus drives it out easily and they just move on. There's still time. There was still, we're still about six months away from the crucifixion. So there's a, this is a dope slap moment. Oh, you guys. But he goes on. While they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, but on the third day he'll be raised. And they were greatly distressed. Is that a figurative third day or a literal third day? Was it really three days? Yeah. yeah. It's a literal three days. But I think the disciples are still not getting it. They think he's talking figuratively and he's not. This is, this is Jesus talking about the calendar and not about some allegory. I'm going to be killed and rise three days later. And they'll realize it later on. That, oh, he meant exactly what he said. Last comment? Yeah, that's what I was just saying. It doesn't belong. Yeah. yeah. So that's, okay, I'm like, oh, you said that. That's where, that, that's why. It's, it's in some, but it's not in all. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. And in Mark, isn't he even more detailed in 22? The elders, the chief priests, the, he like lists the three groups that are coming out. Yeah, and he did it, in Matthew, he did it earlier. Okay. So it's, it's here. It's all here. It's just that it's not in the same clump that Mark gives it to us, and that's okay. You know, that's two different, that's two different people talking about the same car accident. Okay. You know, we're eyewitnesses, okay. but you're going to clump all the words and, I, and, then, and then all the action, and I'm going to talk about the action and then all the words, or whatever it is. They're both accurate. It's just that it probably doesn't belong in this particular gospel because the earliest copies of Matthew don't have verse 21. So for about 400 years, this was not part of Matthew's gospel. And the, the reason it gets, the, the, those textual variations come in is that when translations get made, they're usually made with the most recent copy of the Greek or Hebrew, if they rely on the Greek and Hebrew, rather than the most ancient. The idea of ancient as, as a basis for textual criticism is something that really begins with Luther and comes down to us. But even Erasmus in Luther's time, whom put together the first uh, eclectic Greek text, the full copy of, let's have a standardized Greek text, Erasmus said. He just used the four copies he had laying around in, where was he, in Rotterdam or wherever it was, and, uh, and then that's what they use. And, and then some monks come along and Luther agrees and say, you know, there are, we, we could do better. This is really good, but we could do better. And that's where that comes from. And I think that's where we're going to stop. So we'll stop there and pick it up there again then next time. Until then, God bless all of you. And thank you for letting me do this. See you next time.
You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.